Hello everyone, here is our uh, first video on Islam. Um, Islam is the second largest religion in the world. It has about 1.6 to 1.9 billion with a B followers, 1.6 to 1.9 billion out of a worldwide population of around 7.7 .7 billion. So it's about 20 to 22 percent of the worldwide population. One out of every five people in the world is a Muslim. It's the second largest religion of Christianity but it is the fastest growing religion. It is growing at a faster pace and rate than Christianity is, and it has been growing at a fast pace for quite a while. Um, some estimates, um, statistical you know, projection, um, predict Islam will surpass Christianity as the world's largest religion by 2070. Um, 2070 AD, Islam will just pass up um, uh, Christianity. Um, to look at the, the growth rate, in 1900, Islam was only about 10 to 12 percent of the worldwide population. By 2000, um, it already hit 20 to 22 percent, and that's where it still kind of stands today. So, it had a 10 percent growth in 100 years. In comparison to the same 100 years, um, Christian, so in 1900, Christianity was 35 percent of the worldwide population, but now it's only like 30 to 33 percent. Um, and to this day as well. So um, Christianity dipped a little bit, about, you know, 2%, 3%. Islam grew by 10% in that same time period. So it's the fastest growing religion. Islam, like Christianity, truly is worldwide. It exists everywhere in the world. For some reason, Westerners and particularly Americans think that Muslims um, are, are centered in, in the Middle East and, they're, and they don't live anywhere else. Um, but that's just just not the case. Um, in fact, only 17 to 20 percent of the uh, worldwide Muslim population lives in the Middle East. So in other words, 80 percent of the worldwide Muslim population lives outside of the Middle East. Um, it's just astounding. So 20 percent of Muslims live in the Middle East, 80 percent live outside of the Middle East. And to, for comparison, 20% um, of the Christian population lives in Africa to give you that 20% comparison. So only 20% of Muslims live in the Middle East. 40%, um, 40% of Muslims live in Southeast Asia. So double um, the amount of Muslims that live in the Middle East actually live in Southeast Asia, because again, it's 20% in the Middle East and 40% in Southeast Asia. So double that Middle Eastern population live in Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia. And that would be a good example, it would be Indonesia. Indonesia is the country with the largest Muslim population. And then it's usually like a statistical basic tie between second and third with India and Pakistan. Islam is the second largest religion in India. And then its western neighbor Pakistan is virtually 100% Muslim. Nearly 100% there. Um, the sacred text of Islam is called the Quran. Um, the Quran was canonized put together, compiled, redacted, edited, um, put together as one book. Um, it only took about 25 years at most um, for Muslims to put their holy sacred scripture together. Usually that process of that canonical process of, you know, li listing your scripture, putting it all together, usually takes centuries for other religions. For Islam, it takes like 25 years, interestingly enough. Um, the Quran, and we'll talk about the Quran obviously much more. We'll read directly from it. Um, it actually is the sacred text that marries that mentions Mary the most. Uh, so Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned most in the Quran. She is mentioned more in the Quran than in the Holy Bible, the sacred text for Christians. In fact, interestingly enough, there's a whole chapter devoted to Mary um, in the Quran. Um, Islam is a Western religion. It originated in the Middle East. It's a world, great world religion. It's an Abrahamic religion as well. It has this connection to Abraham, um, without a doubt. All Muslims trace their lineage back to Abraham through her his oldest son, Ishmael, born through Hagar. Muslims, um, Islam itself um, is obviously associated with the Arabic language. Um, because of its history and connection to the city of Mecca, which is in present-day Saudi Arabia. Um, Arabic is a Semitic language, just as Hebrew and Aramaic are. Semitic languages are based off consonantal roots to their words. So the consonants in a word help determine its um, basic meaning. 
So the consonants of Islam would be SLM. That SLM base root always denotes peace. So Islam means the peace you obtain when you submit or surrender to God. So Islam is, is, is basically, Islam means submission. Submission, submit, surrender. That's essentially what Islam, the word actually literally means. Um, it's the peace you obtain when you submit or surrender to, uh, um, to God. One who submits to God is called a Muslim. Muslim is one who submits. So the practitioner, the adherent, the believer in Islam, we call them Muslims. The word for the God in Arabic is Allah. A-L-L, which is this symbol right here. This is calligraphy, Arabic calligraphy, reading from right to left. That's Allah. Allah is the God in Arabic. I don't know why I did that. Get away from the graphic here. There we go. Um, Muslims believe that the God that they worship is the same God um, that Christians, who Christians and Jews believe in and worship and pray. It's all the same God, according to their perspective. That's clearly stated in the Quran. And we can, I'll definitely read that as one of our samples. So Allah is the same God of the Christians and the same God of the Jews. We just may have different beliefs about that God, but ultimately it's the same God. How does that make any sense? Just think of a family member, think of a friend, think of somebody who's famous um, some people love Cardi B, right? Some people love Lady Gaga. Um, some people love Cam Newton um, and Tom Brady. Some people adore them, you know, practically, you know, worship them, follow them on all types of social media. Does everybody like Cardi B? Is everybody in adoration of Tom Brady? Eh. <laughs> some people, to phrase it <laughs> politely, don't like Cardi B and aren't fans of Tom Brady. Um, but, it, you know, regardless of your different opinions about Tom Brady, there's only one Tom Brady. You're still talking about the same person, right? Um, you're still talking about the same quote unquote musician singer Cardi B. Um, so you may have different beliefs about one person, but it's still just one person. That's what I'm kind of saying here about God. Muslims believe it's the same God. You just have different beliefs, maybe. You have your Jewish beliefs, you have your Christian beliefs, and the Muslim has their own Muslim beliefs, but it's all the same God, ultimately. Just two different human beliefs about that one God. So if you're a... You now, this is Arabic, right? Um, Arabic's the language here. That's Allah doesn't mean the Muslim God. It means the God in Arabic. That's the literal meaning. So are there plenty of people in this world? Not, not necessarily plenty, but are there people in this world that speak Arabic, that aren't Muslim, that maybe are members of another religion? Absolutely. And that believe in God? Sure. Who do they pray to? Allah. Allah is not the exclusive Muslim God. It means the God in Arabic. So if you are a Lebanese um, Catholic and you speak Arabic, then you pray to Allah. Um, so don't, you know, don't ever forget that, you know, that basic point. Don't separate this all in your head. Don't take a linguistic difference to automatically mean a religious difference because it's not necessarily um, not necessarily the case. So Islam means peace that you obtain through submission to God. God would be Allah. One who submits to God is a Muslim. To give the basic terms here, um, we can start with our timeline. We have the birth of the prophet Muhammad. Um, he is born in the city of Mecca which is in present-day Saudi Arabia, on the Arabian Peninsula, in the Middle East. He's born in 570 AD. Mecca is a major cosmopolitan, worldly city, because it's a major critical trading outpost, again, on the Arabian Peninsula. Major, major city. Muhammad didn't, he didn't find the city, he didn't discover it or anything like that. It's um, it's, it's nothing like that. All right? It's already a booming, bustling, major economic powerhouse city. Um, it is very economically focused. It's not really focused on ethics and caring for anyone else except your economic bottom line. Um, it's polytheistic because it's welcoming people from all different areas um, to engage in the economy and, again, trading. Um, so it's very, you know, forgiving in terms of your religious beliefs. It's very accommodating in that respect. So it's a worldly, 
um, polytheistic culture and city itself. Uh, Muhammad is born in 570. We can take a look at his family tree here a little bit. Um, he's a member of the Quraysh tribe, which is the most dominant tribe in Mecca. Um, so Meccan society is partly organized around tribal um, familial clans in a definitely a patriarchal sense. His father, Abdullah, dies before he's even born, unfortunately. His mother, Amina, sadly dies when he is sick, so he is orphaned at a young age. Guardianship then passes to his grandfather, Abdul Matalib, who is obviously of advanced age, so he soon dies. So then guardianship and protection and the benefactor goes to Abu Talib, his uncle. Not to minimize the deaths of his parents or his grandfather, but he is a member of the Quraysh tribe, which is the most dominant tribe, and now Abu Talib is his protector. Abu Talib is respected and powerful in the Quraysh tribe. So Abu Talib raises him, Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad becomes a caravan driver. He's a deliverer, right? He will, you pay him and he will transport your goods. So he does a lot of traveling and he meets a lot of different people, different cultures, different areas on his travels. Um, so that's his job. One day, um, and, and he's an introvert. He's definitely a private person. He doesn't seek attention. He's not an extrovert. Let everyone look at me. Um, his personality, his disposition was probably partly shaped by him being acquainted with death at such an early age, again, with the death of his father and his mother and his grandfather. So that may have helped mold and, and just shaped who he is, who he was. Khadijah, a wealthy widower, um, needs to transport some of her goods to Damascus. And so she inquires about Muhammad and everything she hears is always glowing and positive. Um, there's no blemish, there's no negative mark, no critique. He gets full five stars. The Angelist background is perfect. It's glowing, um, you know, for Muhammad. Um, so Khadijah, the wealthy widower, hires Muhammad, and Muhammad does remarkably well at tra transporting all of her goods to Damascus, present-day Syria. Um, and then eventually she actually um, proposes marriage to him, um, and he says yes. So the woman proposes marriage to the man, Muhammad. She is 15 years older. So they marry when he is 25 years old, 595 AD. She is 40. Some people cynically said, well, of course he's going to say yes. She's older and she's got money, so he'll inherit wealth from her. Usually if you marry somebody not out of love but out of monetary gain, you don't take the time to have six kids together. So that's important to stress. They have six kids together. Four daughters and two sons. Death continues. His two sons die in infancy. His four daughters live, but his two sons die, tragically, at a young age. Obviously, infant mortality was much higher, much higher back in these times. Then when he's 40 years old, again, he's private, he's introverted. Um, he was always seeking out moments and opportunities for seclusion and privacy, solitude, to be introspective, meditative, philosophical. He always had that bent, that side to him, just to his character and who he was. So he would always, um, if you couldn't find him at home fulfilling his familial obligations or his employment, um, you know, necessities, transporting goods, you knew he was on Mount Hira um, in the desert. So he's in the de Meccan desert on Mount Hira. I'll add that to the notes here. Um, and he's in a cave just meditating on life. We have no idea what specific particular religion um, Muhammad you know, was before all of this. But when he's 40 years old in 610 AD, as he's in seclusion in a cave, in a cave on Mount Hira, um, the angel Gabriel descends. God, Allah, sends Gabriel down. And Gabriel starts to talk to Muhammad. All of human history changes at this point in 610 AD, when Muhammad, when the Prophet Muhammad is 40 years old. The angel, you know, demands Muhammad, you know, to speak, to recite, recite. And Muhammad basically says, I'm not a reciter. This isn't who I am. I'm not a speaker. I'm not a writer. Basically, I'm not a writer. Perhaps he's, a, he's basically admitting that he's very 
Um, he, know, he, he may know a little bit here and there, but he's over, overall illiterate. Um, and the words, thus the words that Gabriel is speaking, but you start flowing out of Muhammad's mouth. Everywhere he looks, he sees Gabriel. Gabriel takes up his entire panoramic vision and he runs back um, to his home. He's obviously taken aback, to put it mildly. Um, he is totally, totally confused and shaken to his core. Um, obviously, Khadijah sees this very visible, shaken nature of her husband, Muhammad, and she consoles him. She consoles him. Um, the message that Muhammad receives, this is the first one in 610, they continue until his death in 632. They would only come, not at his choosing, but whenever God would send Gabriel. So they were, and they were not always in private. He could be transporting goods, he could be with people, and all of a sudden these words would just start pouring out of his mouth. It, was an, it would be another visitation of the angel Gabriel. Muslims, the Muslim community eventually wrote down, assembled, compiled all of these revelations. They were eventually written down and put together, and that would be called the Quran. The Quran is the sacred text of Islam. The Quran is basically the writing down of all of the divine revelations given to the prophet Muhammad from Allah, God, through the angel Gabriel. That's what the Quran is. The latest is like 655. Muhammad dies in 632. So 20 to 25 years after his death, Muslims have their sacred scripture, the Quran. There will be a later objective lesson um, that obviously I'll have. I'll have for you. Um, the, but the message he receives is going to fly right in the face of Meccan values, society, and culture. They're going to be a disconnect. They're not going to be <laughs> one and the same. Um, the basic parts of this message are monotheism, the belief in one God, not polytheism. Allah is one. God is one. And that the other major core element is there should be an ethical focus on your fellow human, your fellow man and woman, your brother, your sister, the other. You shouldn't just be focused on the self, um, and you shouldn't view others just as an economic means um, to increase your profits your, and your wealth and this commerce economic system of Meccan society. Um, both of those fly directly in the face <laughs> of um, Meccan society itself. So Muhammad, already somewhat reclusive and um, introverted, and he now is going to, you know, deliver a message which is going to be viewed unfavorably, negatively, and burdensome in Meccan society. So it does not go over too well. Um, his wife is his first convert. Abu Talib, his uncle, eventually converts as well. And outside of that, most of the con those that convert are the poor who have nothing in Meccan society. So it's not going over too well. He is clearly blacklisted and identified as an enemy of those in power. Um, eventually, um, they're all kind of quarantined, quartered together, cornered, and um, anyone in his family or his followers are instructed to live together in a corner of the city and they are ostracized they are banned no one is to engage with them communicate with them or you know barter with them or participate with them economically so basically the meccan response is to starve them out to wipe them out that way through starvation through deprivation um if you will um and this introduces the year of sorrows 619 the year of sorrows where khadijah his wife the first convert to islam and his uncle abu talib both die um their bodies are ravaged by this quarantine and, and muhammad kind of blames himself so it's a, it's a horrible year two great sources of, of buttressing support and strength his wife khadijah and his uncle abu talib both die um of course they are older than him so their bodies aren't able to take it as much, unfortunately. Um, and then, but next year, 620 is the night journey. God, Allah, sends um, Gabriel down um, to um, transport Muhammad. It says, Muhammad, we're leaving Mecca. We're going to go visit Jerusalem. That's a journey that should have taken like two months. On foot, 
Gabriel says, don't worry, we'll fly there. So with the help of this Barak, this celestial steed, this heavenly horse, Muhammad is transported from Mecca to Jerusalem, and that which is about 900 miles north, um, and that took um, seconds instead of months. From Jerusalem, he ascends to heaven. He ascends to heaven. So you have the Mihraj event and the Isra. Mihraj is the travel from Mecca to Jerusalem. Isra is the ascent from Jerusalem to heaven. And God, Allah, and Muhammad have a discussion based, you know, together in heaven. Um, Muhammad goes into these different levels and spheres of heaven, and in each one he talks to a various prophet, including Isa or Jesus, Ibrahim, Abraham, um, Musa, Moses, and then he finally gets to God, Allah. Allah says, I've called you here to convey a message to my people. Tell my people to pray to me 50 times a day, 50 times a day. And Muhammad, um, Muhammad says, I will convey the message as always. Musa, Moses stops him as he departs. Says, well, so what did you guys talk about? Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. Um, and, and Muhammad reveals 50 times a day. Musa, Moses like, no, 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 go back in there and negotiate. No one's going to pray to God 50 times a day. And so God, most gracious, most merciful, is understanding and reduces it to 40. And Muhammad says, I'll convey the message. Muhammad tells Moses, Moses like, nope, go back in there. God, being gracious, merciful, and understanding, lightens the load again to 30. Muhammad tells Mo Moses, Moses says, no, go back in there. And it goes to 20, and it goes to 10, and eventually it goes to 5. And, but again, Moses says, no, 5 is still too much. Go in there and have the, <laughs> and negotiate with God, Allah. And Muhammad says, no, enough, five, five it is. I will not negotiate any further, five it is. And so this is why Muslims pray five times a day as they are commanded to do so from the night journey. The, um, the story of Muhammad ascending to heaven from Jerusalem in 620 AD. Muhammad tells this to the people and that just further angers his enemies, his opponents um, even further. Um, so he, now the, you know, Abu Talib died in 619. Now you're telling me you ascended to heaven and talked to this one God. So now it's on. There are plots um, and schemes and plans of assassination. Ali, um, Muhammad's son-in-law, and I'll talk about him more for sure in a second. He hears about one of these plans um, and he says, let me sleep in your bed. Let me sleep in your place tonight and we'll see if they are serious. The plan basically was um, there was one male youth selected from all the other tribes in Mecca, and they would all bring daggers and stab Muhammad to death in the darkness and cover of night. Not just one boy from another rival tribe, but a boy from every other tribe would kill Muhammad to dissuade any type of retribution um, by anyone in the Quraysh tribe with an eye for an eye type of understanding. You're not going to go to war with all the other tribes. You as one tribe going to war against all the other ones. So that's why that plan um, was selected. Um, and it happens, but Ali is not harmed. Once the boys discover that it was Ali and not Muhammad, they all scatter and flee and, and run away. So that confirms the seriousness, the, the gravity of the situation here. And so eventually they flee. Muhammad and his followers in several waves of migration leave Mecca and travel 270 miles north to Yathrib. Yathrib is renamed um, Medina in honor, the city of the prophet. Why do they go to Yathrib? Um, specifically because they're invited. Those in Yathrib are very um, impressed. They find the teachings of Muhammad intriguing and impressive. And so they invite Muhammad to take over the city, which he does. He takes over the city not just in a theological, spiritual, religious sense, but also in a political, governmental, administrative um, sense as well, too. So Muhammad, the prophet of God, uh, becomes the, a politician, a statesman, a governor, if you will. So Yathrib is renamed to Medina, city of the prophet, in honor of, of course, the prophet uh, Muhammad. Muhammad is no fool, though. That's called the Hejra. That's very important, the Hejra. Hejra is flight or migration. That is year. That's what um, that happened in the year 622. That's the beginning of the Islamic calendar. 
that's the very beginning um, of the Muslim calendar. It's the city, it's the first time on earth a city favorably accepts the message of God. So that's the starting point of the Islamic calendar, not the birth of Jesus, but the Hejra, the flight migration out of Mecca, 270 miles north to Yathrib, renamed the city of the prophet Medina. Muhammad is no fool, though. He knows that Mecca is not just going to sit idly by as he stabilizes and lifts up, fortifies the city of Medina on the same peninsula. Mecca is going to view Medina as a threat, an existential threat. Um, as they get more powerful, that will suck some of the power away from them in Mecca. So he says to the people, drafting like a constitution, the constitution of Medina, that if we are attacked, regardless of by whom and for what reason, um, the whole city needs to band together to defend the city. We're not going to be aggressive. We're not going to initiate war or violence, but we're allowed to defend ourselves. We're not just going to let, you know, rival soldiers come and slaughter our families and our wives and our children and destroy our property and eventually kill us in some in whatever order it happens. No, we're allowed to defend ourselves. We're not going to initiate violence. We're not going to be the aggressor, but we are allowed to defend. He knows that Mecca, you know, Mecca's not just going to sit idly by, right? Um, and allow a rival city um, to perhaps take away resources and economic wealth and prosperity blessings from themselves since they're situated um, on the same peninsula. And that's exactly what happens. Mecca does attack Medina. There's a lot of skirmishes and battles until finally 630. Muhammad also becomes a general and he leads his people to a victorious battle and he conquers the Meccans. So Medina conquers under the leadership and guidance of Muhammad, conquers Mecca um, in 630. By all rights, Muhammad in this time period um, is able to kill everybody who survived, but of course he does not. He says, War, this war was defensive on our part. Killing survivors is no, isn't defensive. So it's not valid. It's not moral. So we're not going to kill um, anyone now that the war is over. We are victorious. The war is over. No more killing. It's no longer has a defensive posture. So we're not doing it any longer. Um, there were some in Medina who didn't fight as they should have. He has every right to kill them for violating the constitution of Medina. He forgives. He says the war is over. No more killing. No more killing. One of the first things he does um, after conquering Mecca is he goes to this cube right here, right here, and he cleanses it. He takes all the statues of 360 gods and goddesses and he destroys them. He throws them out of the Kaaba. Kaaba um, in the middle here is Arabic for cube. It is that house of worship you see. Um, it was, it's been built originally by Adam, was destroyed, just naturally destroyed over time. Abraham rebuilt it. Abraham and his son Ishmael uh, rebuilt it. Um, Muhammad cleanses it. He cleanses it. Um, he gets rid of the idols. And thus restores it to its true original purpose to honor Allah. When you perform your hajj, your pilgrimage that you're commanded to do as a Muslim, you will visit the city of Mecca and you will see um, the Kaaba. This is what you will, this is what you face, regardless of where you are in the world. Um, you face Mecca for your five daily prayers because that's where the Kaaba is. And so when you're in Mecca on your hajj, performing your hajj requirement pilgrimage, you'll have the Kaaba right in front of you um, while you're doing your five daily prayers. We can talk about the five daily prayers and the Hajj. We'll get to those. They're part of something called the five pillars. <clears throat> It'll be a later, a later lesson that we'll definitely get to. And then two years later, Muhammad dies. He dies in 632. Why are there different groups of Islam? It's not a cohesive religion anymore. It has two main groups. All are, all, you know, essentially all the religions are the same. They've disintegrated into different groups as well. But you have Sunnis and you have Shiites. We'll definitely discuss those in a later objective too. The reason for their split is because they disagree over who should have succeeded the Prophet Muhammad upon his death in 632. The majority called Sunnis um, state that Muhammad never named a successor. And so... 
let there be an election. Through tribal group consensus, we will select, we will elect who should be the immediate successor to the Prophet Muhammad. And that majority chose Abu Bakr to succeed the Prophet Muhammad. Abu Bakr was basically the closest friend, ally, and confidant of the Prophet Muhammad. So he won that election to succeed um, the Prophet Muhammad upon his death. There's always this minority, though, that says, wait a second, and I'll put them here next to Ali, they're called Shiites, that says, no, actually, Muhammad did name and identify a, a, um, a successor, and that's Ali, his, his uh, son-in-law. He should succeed the Prophet Muhammad. They're always a minority, though. The majority said, no, Muhammad never identified Ali to succeed him. We don't remember that. That would have been more public and explicit. <clears throat> and, explicit. and Ali is just far too young. He lacks the seniority to lead um, Muslims following the, immediately, you know, following the death of Muhammad, right? He can't lead. He's too young. We need someone more powerful with more age and wisdom and seniority, if you will. So the majority went with Abu Bakr. The minority never agreed, and they don't agree to this day. That majority is called the Sunnis. They're like 90% of all Muslims. So it's a, it's an overwhelming majority. The minority are called Shiites. Um, we will definitely talk about them more for sure. Let's just go through a Sunni perspective now. Abu Bakr reigns for two years because he's of a similar age to the Prophet Muhammad. Umar is then selected. He greatly expands Islam throughout the Middle East. You see Damascus, Egypt, and Persia. He dies in battle, and then Uthman is selected. He reigns for 12 years, and he helps kind of guide this canonical process of the Quran, taking all the revelations that Muhammad received from the 40th year of his life in 610 until his death in 632, compiling them all together, and that was done somewhere probably around 650 to 655, somewhere around there, somewhere around there to be more open. We don't know the exact year. And then he dies in battle, and then finally Ali is selected. Um, and he reigns for five years, and he is killed at battle. So you have Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Those are the four rightly guided caliphs. Caliph, that just means successor. They are seen by Sunnis, the Sunni majority, to be the four orthodox or rightly guided caliphs, successors of the Prophet Muhammad. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and then Ali. Shiites always said and continue to say Ali should not have been neglected, ignored, bypassed, or overlooked. He should have directly succeeded the Prophet Muhammad upon Muhammad's death in 632. So there's always going to be that disagreement. And that, this is the major reason why, as to why there are two different groups of Muslims. Some are called Sunni, the majority, 90%. Some are called Shiite, a minority, the largest minority of all the different minority groups in Islam, the Shiites. We can talk definitely much more about them in a later lesson for sure. Ali is killed, and that starts the Umayyad dynasty in Damascus, centered in Damascus. A dynasty is of as a kingdom, an Arab Muslim kingdom. The first one is the Umayyad, Umayyad dynasty. Um, Ali's sons then succeed him. Hassan kind of renounces the claim, the oldest son. He doesn't want to be in this position, so he gives it up, and Hussein, his younger son, takes over. He is killed at Karbala. He is martyred in battle. That's in Iraq. He is killed. Um, and that's kind of seen as like really the birth of the Shiite movement. So Shiites, the martyrdom, the killing of Hussein, is a major, major um, important historical event in Shiite history. And I'll definitely remark, make that remark again when we get to that second objective on Sunnis and Shiites. The Umayyad dynasty crumbles by the Abbasid dynasty, and they establish Baghdad as their capital. Baghdad still to this day is the capital of Iraq. Damascus is still the capital of Syria. Though Syria is, I, I don't necessarily know if it's still a country. It's, it's very unstable, um, basically at the point of a failed state with all the Civil war and strife going on with Bashar al-Assad, if you're following that in the news. but And then eventually the Abbasid dynasty crumbles due to a, a Mongol invasion. Um, it lasts for about 500 years. Um, here's the family tree. 
So the Muhammad is a part of the Quraysh tribe. Don't worry about Hashim. But his grandfather is Abdul Matalam. His father is Abdullah. His mother is Amina. He marries Khadija. Um, I guess I shouldn't skip Abu Talib here, sorry. His father dies before he's born. His mother dies when he is six. Guardianship initially passes to his grandfather, who soon dies because of his age. So then guardianship passes to Abu Talib, um, a very powerful, respected member of the Quraysh tribe. Um, he is married to Khadija, and he has four daughters with Khadija. Four daughters. Khadija dies along with Abu Talib in 619, the year of sorrows. Muhammad does remarry, and he does have multiple wives at the same time. Not to defend polygamy whatsoever, but remember, you saw examples of polygamy in Jewish history with Abraham, Sarah, but then Hagar, and then, you know, Jacob, Israel, with Leah, Rachel, and their servants, Zilpah and Bilhah, right? So be fair. And the thinking was, again, I'm not defending polygamy at all, but the thinking was that if you were a man of certain means and stature, that you should take more than one wife. It was actually the moral thing to do, since a woman could not fend for herself, necessarily. You, if you were of means, you should have more than one wife. So that was the thinking there. So it's not out of lust or, you know, controlling a man, controlling a woman necessarily. It was actually the right thing to do, to help, to help women um, themselves. So that was the, the thinking there. Um, now, Muhammad's daughter, Fatima, marries Ali. Ali is the son of Abu Talib. The, your, the, your uncle's son is your cousin, right? So Ali and Muhammad are cousins because Ali is the son of Abu Talib. Abu Talib is Muhammad's uncle. So they are actually related. Um, so Ali isn't just Muhammad's son-in-law. Since he marries Fatima, he's also his cousin. So Fatima seems to that you married your second cousin, whatever that type of relationship is. So again, marrying within your family, within your tribe, that, that was definitely common. You saw that in Judaism as well, too, um, for sure. Again, with Leah and Rachel being sisters and both married to Jacob. I mean, that, that could have been first cousins. <laughs> this is second cousins, but again, moving beyond that. I don't want to disregard it too much, though. So Ali is cousins and son-in-law to the Prophet Muhammad. They have two, Ali and Fatima have two sons, Hassan and Hussein. Thus, they are the grandsons of the Prophet Muhammad. Here are your four Orthodox Caliphs from a Sunni perspective. Because again, Muhammad did not name, select, or identify a successor. So thus, tribal group consensus and election should be held to, who, to decide who should succeed the Prophet Muhammad. And that's Abu Bakr, then Umar, Uthman, and Ali. These are the years they reign from a Western Common Era AD perspective. AH is in the year of the Hejra, Anno Hejrare, in the year of the Hejra. Because again, the Islamic calendar begins with the Hejra of 622 AD. We can get to Sunnis and Shiites, some differences between them. What do I mean by Imam? We can get to all that um, for sure later in our next objective, our next lesson. But this is just a brief review of Islamic history with our timeline. We mentioned a lot with you know Sunnis and Shiites, Sunnis and Shiites, and we talked about the Hajj and prayer. So we'll get to the five pillars in a later objective um, as well too. All right, everybody, have a great day.